Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Uh, this is Stephen Spector, your host, and with me is, of course, Rob Hirschfeld. Good, uh, good morning, Rob. Stephen, hello. Well, it's, it's good to see you. And, and again, we continue our guests. And um, I'm excited because, uh, you know, we have the global CTO for DevOps from Pivotal and talking to Pivotal is always interesting. And uh, welcome, Mark Embriaco. And Mark, I think I just said it wrong. So I apologize. No, you got it exactly right. Good morning, Stephen and Rob. Oh, well, that's great. So Mark, give us a, a short little uh, history. I know you've worked at some really cool places. And I think our listeners will be like, wow, I would have liked to have worked at one of those. <laughs> Everybody wants to be Mark at the end of oh the day. Oh my gosh. So go That's ahead and give us a quick, quick preview before we start. Big Mark is overrated. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I work at Pivotal today. Um, my title is apparently Global CTO of DevOps. It's a new one. I think that's what it is. We'll see. Um, my job is to go and talk to sort of Fortune 1 to 2000, to Global 2000 customers who are in the middle of some sort of transformation about turning my ringer off when I get on podcasts. I mean, no, actually about their transformations and, and what I've learned along the way um, and how we can be helpful. Uh, so I'm sort of a mix between a, a Catholic priest taking their confession and a coach. Um, the way <laughs> uh, That's DevOps in a nutshell. I love isn't it. it. I came up with that one recently and I've been using it and it's been getting good responses. So I'm going to stick with it. Um, I've been in this industry for about 25 years doing a mix of uh, software development and uh, operations I'm mostly known for operations leadership uh, over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. I was the first ops hire at a company called 37 Signals. They're now called Basecamp. It's where Ruby on Rails was created. Um, also, keynoting RailsConf this year, very excited. So mm -hmm. it'll be fun to be back on stage with uh, David Hansen. Um, I went from Heroku, I mean, I went from 37 Signals to a company called Heroku. Um, I led cloud ops there. I was the 20th employee and we, we went from 60,000 apps to a million and a half on the platform in about 18 months and got bought by Salesforce along the way. So that was pretty fun. Uh, I went from there to Living Social where I was the VP of Tech Ops for about a billion dollars a year in transaction volume. Um, it seemed like a good starter project for e-commerce. So, you know, there we go. Um, then I had the chance to work at GitHub and the thing I was, I've been really passionate about for, uh, since I joined Heroku really, and ever since is this idea of enablement, enabling developers the whole Andreessen software is eating the world thing really resonates with me. So uh, if the place that I can have the most impact is by enabling other people to deliver amazing things, um, that's where I want to focus my energy. So, so I had the chance to go to GitHub where I spent a couple of years. Uh, it was amazing. Um, very sad to leave there when I did um, completely stupid reasons that had nothing to do with anybody disliking anybody or anything else. But, um, but I love GitHub and it's, uh, it's an amazing place. And I went to DigitalOcean, um, where I was the VP of Tech Ops for a public cloud across you know, multiple continents. So that was kind of fun. Um, I did that for about a year before I decided I wanted to take the plunge on my own startup. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years and uh, suffered exactly the same fate as most startups. You know, we, we worked really hard and invested way too much of ourselves for a couple of years and then it didn't pan out. Um, but I uh, learned a ton along the way. Then I joined Pivotal and for the last year I've been at Pivotal, you know, talking to customers and hearing their stories and, and giving advice and having a lot of fun actually. So glad to be here. That's awesome. And Pivotal sort of nails the, you need to understand why you're using our technology, not just how it works. Um, yeah, exactly. And I've been a big fan of the, the sort of platform story around, uh, around the value of platforms, obviously since, you know, since way back at Heroku, um, to me, that story of an empowering developers to um, not only get their code in production, but to provide them the tools they need to live with it is huge. And I think it segues nicely into our conversation today. Makes sense. And, and for, for listeners, we have a big topic uh, about open source projects, products, and sustaining open source. And, and sort of you know, Mark and I both have this operational bent um, which I know for me is can get very frustrating when you're dealing with open source uh, projects and communities. But we're not going to talk about that first because it's going to absorb the oxygen and, and we've run out of time. Uh, we had a previous conversation about, about SRE and, of course, we want to talk about Edge a little bit. So, Mark, we're going to try and time box SRE and, and Edge conversations and leave time for, for open source. Does that sound good? Perfect. So SR, you and I talked about SRE a bit. Um, how do you define SRE? Uh, so I define it as go read the Google book. But um, to me, yeah, to me, it's, it's a couple of things, right? I think the, uh, at a high level, SRE is about building um, 
expectations up front about how apps are going to perform, behave, and be cared for throughout their life, right? Um, and at a high level, what that means is that the team that builds the app is ultimately responsible for the app, um, even if there's an ops group that answers pages in the middle of the night, right? So the SRE model, um, I'll, I'll give the 30 second view that's gonna be radically incomplete, but um, in an SRE world, you have a couple of different constituencies. You have this group of SREs, these site reliability engineers, and this group is uh, expert at sort of building tools to maintain applications at scale. They're expert at um, understanding architectural flaws that may come up in production, at dealing with those kinds of issues when they happen, at managing uh, large scale applications um, across a, a big portfolio, right? So, so that's their job. Their job is to understand how apps fail, to be able to deal with that, to be able to build mitigations, to build tools and frameworks around managing that kind of failure. Um, so, so this was this was what you had described in your your intro as supporting the platforms that make other people productive. Is, yeah, exactly. Do you see do you see SREs as sort of the platform people in an organization from that perspective? So I, th I think it depends. I think the answer is yes, um, but I think that there are SREs with different types of roles. So managing the platform, managing those tools is definitely one of the things that fits in a typical SRE world. Um, but also managing the applications that runs on the platform is often a SRE role. And we'll talk, we can talk more about that in a second, but the, um, in the Heroku model, for example, in the platform model, the platform operator and the app operator, those are completely separate roles, completely separate personas. So the platform operator doesn't necessarily have to be responsible for the app. Um, in SRE, that's really not the case. SREs are all about the SREs also taking ownership of the apps operations within pre-agreed conditions and boundaries, right? So I think it's a little bit different, um, but the SREs are still the ones who have the right domain knowledge and context to be responsible for the platform and the services that are offered across it. Well, I mean, to me, if you're deploying a platform and you don't understand the applications or have insights into the applications, you can't, the, the, the platform can't support the applications well because you're not gonna get the observability and monitoring, you're gonna have this, this yep. sort of awkward handoff because the platform matters. You can't, you know, you can't just totally. black box your platform. Yeah, I think that's true. But I think it's the difference. The difference isn't um, it's, I agree with you that the people who operate and run and run the platform and who own the platform as a product, by the way, the platform is a product, just like the, the apps that run on it are a product have to understand their customers. They have to understand the apps. They have to understand what their needs are, but they don't have to be the ones that answer the pages at two in the morning. And that's where SRE is a little bit different because SREs are often the people who also answer the pages at two o'clock in the morning. Right. There's still the ongoing ops perspective, exactly. keeping, keeping the lights on type of thing. It's interesting. We, we had a conversation with Erica Windish about uh, Lambda and serverless, mm -hmm. and the black boxiness of that. And I, I think that what you're, what you're describing that resonates with me is that's not necessarily a good thing, right? SREs are, able to take the applications and work downwards into the stack? Is that a fair? I think, I, part of that part of that fair. I think the, the real power of SRE honestly has very little to do with the fact that they have insight into the infrastructure. I think it's more a, um, SRE is all about enabling developers to focus on the delivering value in the code rather than focusing on uh, sort of day-to-day -day operational world. Now, this the sneaky part of SRE is we also force them to to worry about the reliability part because the way SRE works, um, and we didn't get to this, uh, in, in the SRE model, a development group builds an application. They own the application, they're responsible for it in production. At some point, they can decide that they wanna offload those production operational responsibilities to, to another group. And this is sort of the classical Google SRE model. It's, SRE is not, uh, you know, it's not done the same everywhere, but this is, I'm describing this sort of platonic ideal Google model, right? Uh, yeah. This development group decides they're ready to hand this thing off. They start having a conversation with the SREs. The SREs make them, not make them. The SREs work with them to do things like define what the service level objectives are for that app, how it should behave, how do we know it's working, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the allowable number of errors that this app can generate over X time period, right? We call this the error budget. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of the SRE model is that you agree to these things up front. So, you know, you look at this at the beginning, you're like, well, that sounds a lot like ops. Developers build an app, they hand it off to ops. Ops has to run it. Um, the difference and the critical difference is agreeing to those expectations up front around how it's going to behave and importantly, what you're going to do when it doesn't behave. 
Um, and this takes some organizational fortitude because in the SRE model that Google presents, you define these behaviors up front, you define these error budgets, and the developers are free to do whatever they want. They can deliver new features, they can continue to focus on just app code that's gonna to go to customers, as long as the app doesn't generate more errors than the error budget allows. And as soon as it does, they aren't allowed to ship any new features until they address that. And that's agreed okay. to up front, and it's not an emotional conversation when ops people are getting woken up every night. So this to me is essentially, is the essential piece of where SRE is more DevOpsy than people realize. Because mm -hmm. the, the assumption that I get in conversations with SRE is it's just a rebadging of ops. Yeah, not at all. And, and what you just described is we have an ongoing equal relationship where everybody's responsible for production, operations, and development. But what we've done is we've said, you know what, if, if you're playing by certain rules and you're not causing a lot of fires, you can focus more on the dev side of your job and less on the production side. But you can never ignore it. Right. If, if, you, if you're causing fires, you're going to be fighting those fires, right? The whole team is fighting the fires. Exactly. And it's the, the interesting part is those rules aren't arbitrary, right? It's not just that the ops group or the SRE group said, this is what we think matters. Those rules are very deliberate because they're the kinds of structure that allows an SRE group to manage applications at scale, right? So you set error budgets and you define how apps work and how, what they interface with the rest of the environment and how the platform functions in a way that allows you to operate a disproportionate number of applications to the number of people that you have supporting them because there's consistency, there's expectations, and you manage the expectations for how the apps behave and how, they get, how the problems get remediated and, and reinforce the fact that the product team owns that app forever. Right, the SREs, the other part of the stick here is that SREs, if, if the development teams and the product owner aren't keeping up their side of the bargain, if they're outside of the air budget for too long, the SREs can just say, you know what, it's, it's not our problem anymore. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start segueing us to Edge yeah. through this idea of platform. Okay. Um, because what, what, what you keep sort of bouncing against in this is that there's a platform here that's running the apps. SREs are, are responsible for sustaining the platform. Why, why are platforms essential for this whole model? Let's, well, so first of all, there's always a platform, whether you realize it or not, right? Um, that collection of chef scripts and puppet scripts and Ansible scripts or whatever, or shell scripts even, it's a platform at the end of the day. It's a poorly understood, ad hoc, um, you know, crazy evolutionary platform, but it's a platform still. Um, the value of platforms like Kubernetes or a Cloud Foundry uh, or a Heroku are that they give a definition to the interfaces for that platform in a way that, that sort of the ad hoc ones that we've built for the rest of our careers haven't, right? Um, we've done things like said, this is how we deploy apps and they go in this directory and things like that. But the, the Kubernetes and Cloud Foundries and Herokus of the world take that to another level and they add a lot more definition about what services the platform offers and what it doesn't. And it gives you an, uh, a, a clear boundary of where responsibility can hand off if you decide to follow that model, right? So above the, above the line of the platform's services, it's the application operations responsibility. And I think it's important when I, when I think about um, when I think about who owns operations for what parts of the platform, I don't think about who owns it. I think about it in terms of personas because it doesn't always have to be a separate person, but there are separate sets of duties that may be, may be, oper may be owned by the same person or may not. Um, and that's highly organizationally dependent. But when you have that platform boundary that's clear, you can say, okay, the platform is operated as this persona. The application, everything that's above that clear interface is, is this persona. And it gives you a lot of leverage to have things that you don't have to care about. If you have a solid platform that is well understood, is well monitored and well maintained, um, you can, as an application operator, you can disregard the platform a lot of times as the source of your issues and only focus on your app and trust that the platform is, uh, is going to know when it has issues itself or, or the team that runs it is gonna, gonna have monitoring in place, is gonna be able to see that there's problems across a number of apps that are on the platform, et cetera. Um, obviously it's not always the case, but you know, if you have a large scale platform outage, it becomes clear very quickly that it's not the individual apps that are the issue. That makes sense. And so, I mean, when we look at 
edge, and I, I'm going to have to ask you to define what you what you mean by edge. Oh God! Um, uh, no, you don't don't, Just don't ask me to define DevOps. Um, the, the, that that's no the, no worries on that one. Um, the but because I, I you know I think so I'm interested in your definition of edge and then how you fit this platform concept into what you see emerging as edge. Yeah, it's interesting. So when we before we before we went on air here, I I admitted to um, not having given a great deal of thought to edge as a as a thing because to me it's one of those things that's fairly obvious. So it's it's like I don't I haven't thought about it a whole lot. So I haven't really thought about a definition, but let's let's go for it. Um, um gosh, I don't know. Like the it, it's it's compute that's closer to the user maybe is probably the simplest way okay. to think about it, right? Uh, I'll take that. That's a good yeah, one. Compute that's closer to the consumer is the way I think about it. That that's, works for me. Um, so I, the, the element to me that, that is especially challenging from an edge perspective is that it's also geographically distributed. Um, and so there, there's two there's two elements that I would add as a challenge for that. I totally you know you're, you're nailing that the 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 proximity, but it has geographic distribution and lack of physical access. Yep. Um, and so from that perspective, right? We we your definition of platform seems right. We're going to have to have platforms at the edge that are very. Um, it's that, that solve problems that allow people to work in a way that, that where they, they can't really turn a lot of knobs, where they can't tune it, right? You're, you're going to have an application running in thousands, hundreds of thousands of locations. Yep. It's not like Lambda where you run it in US West 2 and th thumbs up, I'm good. Um, you're going to be running it, right, on Maple Street, on Main Street, on, you know, the intersection or of route, uh, get out of town, and I don't know where I am. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, that's definitely a challenge for developers. I think it's more of a challenge for the operators of those platforms at the edge, frankly, than it is for the developers. But it's, it's absolutely a problem, a challenge for developers. And the reason I say it's more a challenge for the operators is that part of the... Um, and we can, the, I tweeted yesterday, in fact, about how edge is going to be the most watered down term um, <laughs> it's following, it's following cloud and everything else, because I got into a conversation recently about how it's like, okay, well, are the, are the processors in cars edge? Somebody said, I was like, that doesn't come on. Where's IOT and edge? Like, just can we please stop? It doesn't matter. Right. No, it's, it's, it's market. market. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, uh, but the, from the point of view of the developer, if the platform boundary is good, I don't have to worry about a lot of the things that I would care about in this distributed world, right? I choose my platform on the basis of the reach that it has for the customers I want. Presumably that platform does things for me like uh, geographic routing and uh, distribution of my code to the edge nodes and, and bringing the logs back to a central place where I can debug and all of those things. Uh, so I think from the point of view of a user, if the platform provides you the tools that you need, it shouldn't be fundamentally different than managing an application in US West 2, for example. Um, and if your platform doesn't provide you that, then you probably shouldn't use Edge until you find one that does because the complexity of managing an application that's deployed to hundreds of Edge nodes around the world without those kinds of tools is not worth it. Uh, you just shouldn't even consider it unless you are going to invest in building your own Edge platform. Um, yeah. Unless you're a CDN provider, right? But, like, those platforms, but those platforms in that geographic information doesn't exist, right? If you're building edge applications today. Um, nobody is. So first of all, nobody really is. Um, okay. Effectively, effectively zero people are. So that's okay. <laughs> yeah, the applications, I, I agree with you, aren't, aren't really there. Or they're, <laughs> or they're done in very custom ways, right? This yep. is the, um, yeah, this, this is the challenge. Do you think those platforms are going to be new or are they going to be adaptations of platforms we've already got? I think we're going to see way less individual um, companies and developers, at least in the short to medium term. I think we're going to see very few sort of organizations build an app that runs on the edge if they aren't also the operator and owner of the platform at the edge. I think we're going to see far more services delivered at the edge 
from people like CDM providers who extend into things like authentication, for example. Um, okay. Good friends run a company called Backplane.io that does this. All right, they build this uh, sort of uh, zero trust network at the edge and they've got some fancy VPN like backhaul encrypted stuff and they do authentication and, and it's really cool. And it works because they do the distribution at the edge and they manage that and that's part of the service. So I think we'll see, I think we'll continue to see a lot of that in the short to medium term because it's not super clear, I don't think, to, to most people what applications they would actually find value in running closer to the edge. Um, until you start talking about things like IoT and, and other things that we can have a conversation about whether those are edge or not. Um, I don't know, and honestly, I don't, know, I don't have an opinion there. Um, I haven't thought enough about it yet. But I think we'll see fewer applications like that in the short term just because we got enough on our plates. And the question is how many applications are really going to right, benefit in the short term from that geographic closeness. If we start talking about things like IoT, um, Mark Teeley makes the argument recently that Edge is really good for cases where, like driverless cars is one of his favorite examples, right? Yeah. You generate a ton of data locally, the uh, compute has to react to that data, it can't afford the latency to send that data somewhere else. That's a beautiful use case. I don't know if it's Edge though, right? I, I don't know, I guess it's Edge. This is, this is part of the problem. We don't know what, the, what Edge really means. Um, so I, I think that there's, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's not that hard to imagine uh, a metro area distribution of small data centers at maybe even at every major intersection that are, are coordinating traffic for that intersection, right? And they represent uh, a, a inter interconnection for all the cars in the area using a 5G network where there's low latency and they offload a certain amount of compute process. So it, it's, so here's, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. Um, and we don't, I don't want to go too far on this because I, I don't like to play the um, edge scenario bingo game. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But, but this, is, this, it, this is real um, as from an IT infrastructure perspective. So if you put too much compute in the car, it reduces the efficiency of the car. It's actually, a, a, it's, it's weight, electricity, computing power, things like that. And so for the most part, cars are driving in straight lines in pretty well-defined places until they get to an intersection and then things get super messy. And so, and so it's perfectly reasonable. I don't think the IT infrastructure is all there yet, but the intersection could actually be doing a degree of processing, coordination, and you know, AI for the cars all entering the intersection. And the cars should actually be slaved, it's the wrong word, the cars should actually be uh, collaborating through that central point, not with each other, but through a, a, a orchestration system for the intersection, because that actually has the, all the information. The cars, even though humans do it today, the cars, in an optimal system, the cars are not making their own decision about how to enter the intersection there working through a central broker, that central broker is edge, IT infrastructure at the edge, using standard AI, you know, machine learning platforms, all that other stuff, you're, you're, you're giving me a look. Yeah, I mean, no, and I think it's super interesting, because I was, I was gonna disagree with you at first, because, but it was about something that doesn't really matter. Um, so I'll, I'll just... Um, Those are the best type of disagreements. Yeah, yeah, exactly, it's no, like the, but, the, the cars are doing a lot, even when they're going in those straight lines, because the world is not predictable and they don't know when a toddler's okay. going to run out in front, right? So they have to they have to have a lot of compute and they have to have a lot of sensors and they have to be able to make decisions themselves in the in their local environment. But you make Correct. a really really good point about them only having a local view unless they get data from uh, from sources that are uh, slightly less local, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like the. I think you're you're totally right that if you build, you can imagine a universe where the we have good visibility, you know, at the intersection and at other various sensing points about the flow of traffic in the aggregate and the there's there's a place for, you know, I'm starting to come around on the fact that cars are probably probably edge because they saw they have a lot of the same challenges from the point of view of manageability and those kinds of things, um, yeah. but they also rely heavily on data from other parts of a different edge. Um, so they're an edge and they're also, an, they're like, 
they're an edge and they talk to other edges and their other edges aren't just cars. The other edges may be things like this traffic monitoring and reg mm -hmm. sort of regulating the flow of traffic, right? Orchestration. Um, or we, we or a pedestrian of, or a bike or a train or a... Uh... Yeah, traffic orchestration um, is kind of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think, I think you're absolutely right that that makes a lot of sense um, at a high level. I don't know if we get there. Like the whole driverless car thing is one that I've got hugely mixed feelings on, so... Um, all right, so so let's let's not try and yeah, drive. Please, it, please not. not not drive into that conversation. Not. Um, but I think this is really useful. We we need to move into the open source side of this, and there there, there is actually a segue um, for this. Segways you'd have to monitor too; they'd be in the traffic. Um, oh, that's horrible. The you know a lot of what we're talking about is sustaining engineering it's yep. protocols it's things in the field it's it's not development and so you and i had a, a sort of back and forth um a little bit about open source projects versus product and and sort of the idea was that a product has something different in it than a project does do you want to you want to sure recap? yeah so this started i tweeted something um I retweeted something yesterday and I made the observation. And I, so obviously my job at Pivotal, I've talked to a lot of people about DevOps and things they should do and things they shouldn't. And I got, I've got this deck and one of the things on the deck that, that I say, and then I immediately uh, recant is I say that there's no one size fits all model for DevOps, right? It's, it's all organizationally dependent. And then I say, but there are a handful of things that are not negotiable. And one of them is that you have to behave in terms of products, you have to think about your applications as products and not as projects. Um, and to me, when I think about the differences there, they're all about the sustaining part of what you're talking about, right? Their right. projects have an end date. They have a, an end state. You know when a project is done. If I'm painting the walls of my office, when I'm done painting it, the project is over. Um, if that wall gets marked up by something in the future, that's out of the scope of that project. The project doesn't care about that anymore. Um, right. It's a new project to fix that. Um, obviously, then, that's not useful so, for some. <laughs> Yeah, but we always call these things open source projects, not open Yeah, I think they're poorly products. named. You think they're badly named? I think they're badly named because uh, projects have end states and, and products don't. Products have people who care about the features they have. Products have, have people who iterate on them. Products have people who maintain them. This is why, so, wow. so my observation, Rob said, well, I agree with you, this product you have to think about products and not projects. How does that, how does that fit in with these open source things and how, how concerned do we need to be? And, and my response was, I think open source projects are really more like products in the ways that I care about. I accept the ones that I see is that the project is always like the front edge, the developers and you know, all the, Ooh, yay, the next version's out. Yeah. Um, let's give it a cool code name and, and then you know, jump to the next. The, they, they typically throw sustaining to a vendor and then shame vendors for being commercial entities. Um, yeah, I think it depends on the project. And I'm going to say yeah. project because open source projects call themselves that. But I think it depends on the, in the open source community how they deal with that. And my response, yeah, so the, the continuation of this conversation was only a couple of tweets, so it wasn't really a conversation. Yeah. This is the That's conversation. I want. This, I, I've been spending a lot of time... And if people have been listening to the podcast, they'll, they'll see this emerge as a theme sort of next to edge, which is sustaining a, a company's infrastructure yeah. it, from an operational perspective requires a different type of engineering. I think that's probably true, yeah. Then what I usually see happen in open source projects. Yeah, and so my point of view on that is you have to be mindful of when you evaluate a, an open source component for inclusion in your system, uh, whether it's a configuration management tool or a library to do authentication or, or whatever it happens to be, right. you have to evaluate it, not just on the basis of its technical capability, you have to evaluate that community and the way that they maintain that project and the way they support it and, and understand what that means for you in terms of your responsibilities, right? Where does the, ultimately it's your responsibility. So what, would you, what, do you, what do you look for from that perspective? Well, you, you look for things like, is it active, right? Are there, have there been recent changes to this? Is the, is the community iterating here still, right? Is there activity? Um, was, were there recent CVEs? How did they deal with them? Um, you know, is there a, do they have, do they have things like codes of conduct, for example? And that may seem weird, but that tells you that they're thinking about 
the project and the community in a way that needs to be sustained. Um, so that having a code of conduct, for example, is a really strong signal that the people responsible for that, that open source project, I'm getting tied in knots around that term because we, we're, we're conflating things, but the open right. source community around that, the, the developers have thought enough about the fact that this community needs to be a thing that, um, that is ongoing to have cared about that. Um, look at the issue tracker. Are there, look at, look at the pull requests. Are there, you know, 300 open pull requests that haven't been merged over the last six months? Um, so all those things, there's lots of signals you can use to evaluate it. Usually it's fairly easy, right? It's like things that have a lot of adoption that have um, active communities that have a strong sort of core committing team. Ruby on Rails is a great example of the kind of open source project that you probably shouldn't think twice about adopting. Spring is another good example. Kubernetes is another good example where they have strong structure in place to support them. They've proven that they know how to deal with things like security issues and release management and integrating with the developers and, and so forth. Now all those things, actually Ruby on Rails is probably the one that's the, got the least commercial backing for it, but still mm -hmm. has all those kinds of structures in place. Kubernetes is an example of the other direction where you probably don't want to use raw Kubernetes if you can avoid it because it's got enough moving parts and complexity that you want to have somebody to help you support it. So it's, a, it's so, complex, right? So when the support, it, so, so you're saying in, in a case like Kubernetes, you know, pick up, either pick up a vendor package or use it as a service from that perspective. Yeah, pick up a vendor package, use it as a service or commit to being part of the community, right? You, those are your options. You don't, if, you, if you're an organization at any sort of scale and you pick it up and you don't want to, you don't take on the responsibility of being an active part of the community and um, understanding how the code works and you don't want to pay a vendor to help support you, um, you probably shouldn't use it. You should just use Google's option, for example, or Amazon. So what is, what is the vendor adding? I, I strongly agree with this, right? It's, it's you know, be, and, and the way I would tip that is to say, people should be more willing to be, to pay a vendor. But what does the vendor give you in that? What's, what's the, what's the, yeah. the value? Back? Yeah, the vendor gives you the things that you would be doing yourself if you committed to being part of the community, right? They, they understand the issues you have, um, depending on the agreement you have with that vendor, maybe they patch bugs that you run into and they advocate for getting those things back into the upstream. They negotiate with the community at large. They're part of the, the, the open source community. Um, and, and they help make sure that the, the issues that you hit in production get, get smoothed over or worked around or uh, help you deal with the complexities of operating the software yourself. Um, so I think they give you a ton of value there. They also, a lot of times just give you packaging in a way that, that, makes sense for you to deploy without having to reinvent the wheel yourself over and over again. Right. Um, there's, there's, there's a thing. So there's a tension to me in a lot of open source communities because we, we, we have a tendency to not we're trying to find the right word. Um, we, we, we look at, at vendors commercializing open source projects as scans. Um, it's very easy to, to, to throw shade at them. Maybe that's yep. the right word. Um, and at, at the same time, I feel like the, the, the profit motive creates a, a positive incentive for people to reduce the friction of supporting a lot of people using something you know, effectively. So if I'm a vendor, either I'm going to be consulting with you about the product and I have no incentive to create economies of scale, yep. which strikes me as, as, as an anti-pattern. Yep. Um, for open source, or I'm trying to sell you a license and to do that effectively, I need to reduce my cost of maintenance so that I can sell you, a, I can sell a lot of people licenses that would be less expensive than them maintaining it, but I get a profit because I've, I've made that efficient, more efficient. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think that's reasonably fair. So um, context here, the startup that I did for two years before I joined Pivotal, um, our product was open source. Um, right. It's called Operable. We built an open source chat ops platform for uh, people who had security and audit and those sorts of issues, right? And we made the decision from the very first that it was going to be open source. So I thought a lot. I've thought a lot about these issues. I think um, I think everything you said is correct. I also think the the people who throw shade on commercialization of open source need to just stop because um, usually it's nonsense. And when it's not nonsense, fine. Go ahead and throw as much shade as you want. 
But the reality that I see in almost every case is that the people who are offering support for projects, and there, there are, there are counterexamples that, that are obvious that you can find, but it's almost always the people who wrote the most code. It's almost always the people who created the project in the first place are the right. ones who are also building a commercial entity around it. And you don't get to complain about how they use the thing they built. Um, so please just stop. If you don't want to pay them, thank them for giving you the open source thing in the first place instead. But don't complain about the way that they, they operate their business or the fact that they have to, to try to generate revenue. Because right. that's just or, the reality. Or, the, or, that they, or they put a tripwire in that says, now not everybody likes the way some tripwires are built, but if they put a tripwire in, they're doing it because they're like, well, we have to sustain our... Right. Yeah, I mean, and it's absolutely fair game to complain when when vendors who also built the product do things like um, intentionally keep it hard to use in order to drive people to pay for service. That's bullshit, and they should stop doing that. Those people should feel bad, and I hope they go out of business. I don't know. I yeah, I won't, I won't name my favorite example. Um, and that that to me is one of those examples where the, I I ask questions about tragedy of the commons effect where if there's multiple vendors competing around a core, sometimes they fight around installers or they fight around and, and that's, huh. and it doesn't, it doesn't come back into, Hey, we just need to keep a small tight core that is, you know, functions well and then allow an ecosystem to build. Actually, this is one of the things I like about what cloud Foundry's done is cloud foundry is very deliberately small core ecosystem um yeah it's it's that's really hard uh i don't think we as an industry and as a as a technology community have found the right answer there yet frankly i think we see directional signs that things are improving right and the i'm i don't want us to segue into a long conversation but i think it's fair to say that a great example of that vendor um butting of heads is OpenStack. there's everybody recognizes this is a problem um and it's been a problem for a long time we don't need to go into a whole lot of detail no. um, i think kubernetes has successfully so far navigated that mostly um and it's interesting to me how that has happened and how it's worked um, they're not perfect by any stretch but i think they do a really good job and they're trying to be deliberate about it and they have done a reasonable job of having the, the architectural decisions and design driven, not by vendor special interests. Um, I, I agree with you. And I think that a small core mantra has been part of that. Um, totally where agree. Kubernetes typically has been saying, look, this is something that is vendored. Let's, let's, let's create an API and, and, and push it out of the mm -hmm. product but only after they've gotten the base, you know, they, they've sort of gotten the base API. To me, the, the, the prototypical example in OpenStack was Cinder, was done with, you know, in a very methodical way, shout out to John Griffiths, um, to, to sort of say, look, this is a vendor interaction point, but we're not, we're gonna do that in a very clean way. Um, yeah, there, there's a part of me that wants people to be actually saying, I like that, open source projects have a monetization point. Totally. Uh, and and it's, it is troubling when people walk into open source projects assuming that they're gonna get a whole bunch of free stuff and free support. Um, I agree, and, support vampires. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting to me, the biggest companies in some cases are the most egregious. Um, for that, and I understand it's a scale problem for them, but uh, the thing that, that your comment, pulling us all the way back to the tweet so we can try and start wrapping up, um, but what I, what, I, what I see happening is if you're going to use an open source software and there's nobody in that project or product thinking about how to create economies of scale around supporting and sustaining it. Yep. If, if that doesn't have a commercial motivation, then the, the, the whole effort is going to be in trouble. Um, and it, and the commercial motivation there could just be to generate enough revenue to pay the people that want to work on it to let them work on it. It doesn't need to be they're trying to get rich. It could just be right. they want to work on this project and they need to pay, you know, they need to pay their water bill and send their kids to college. Um, not they're trying to become, you know, the next, I don't know, Jeff Bezos. Um, right. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. 
And that, I mean, and it's important because if you're going to build your business on an open source uh, code base um, and it doesn't have a way to cover the cost of sustaining engineering, then you've, you've got a serious problem, right? I mean, when we, you know, in our, in our business, we look at cobbler, which, you know, is a dead unsustained project with nobody maintaining it. And we know tons of businesses who, you know, bring it up. Don't, they can't do security patches. They don't have any way to do new APIs on it. It's, it's not. So that's the softball example. Let's think about our industry as a large and how, how, how we have collectively over the last, it's crazy to me only over the last two or three years really started to take this seriously as a problem. Open SSL. Um, Mm -hmm. How long did we go with the entire internet relying on open SSL um, that didn't have anybody that was really paid to do work on it or care about it. I mean, and this is not to say the development team didn't care about it. They absolutely did, but their resources are incredibly limited when that's not what they do to, to stay alive and to keep their families moving. Uh, NTP is another great example. So we've got this critical infrastructure, uh, We've got funding for some of this critical infrastructure now, thankfully, supported by Google and others in the industry. Um, And it's fantastic. But it's not scalable, right? You can't scale that to every project that exists. You can't have a small set of companies funding the infrastructure that the entire world operates on. So there's a, it it takes a mix, right? It takes, it takes projects like, um, it takes projects like Rails, for example, that has, that's maintained by people who use it. Uh, right. and that makes sense because their audience is developers, right? The audience for Ruby on Rails is developers, developers, and specifically developers who write in the same language that the platform is written in and who can support it and who can send patches and who have needs and so on. So that's a, that's a great example of a community that works very nicely with organic uh, ongoing support. And they've got a, a, a leadership team that still cares about it and drives it forward and so on. Um, but then when you shift to things like Kubernetes and OpenStack, for example, um, you have a different model. You have a constituency of users who use it who aren't necessarily the same people who are capable of writing it. Um, right. And you end up in a and place. That's okay. Where, yeah, it's completely okay. But you, as an organization, that means you got to figure out how you how you support this thing yourself. So if the community is not going to be there to support it for you, um, and you should never assume that they will be, you need to figure out what the model that works for you is. Do you buy it as a service from somebody? Do you pay a vendor to? to be that interface to the community for you and to advocate on your behalf to the community, um, how you engage with that project. I think we need to, as an industry, we need to stop trying to shame the companies that are making, trying to make money on open source. I think we can absolutely point when they make bad decisions in terms of their model. I think open core is completely fine, for example, but I think it's, you have to be very careful about how you draw the boundaries between what's open source and what's not um, in ways that aren't. um, And this one, Honestly, I don't think there's a moral stand here. I think it just, as a, from a business point of view, the way you draw that line says a lot about how you, you plan to monetize that thing and how customers should think about you. And some of it comes back to the customers and how the customers show that they want to, you know, take the, the, the core parts and then, and then be part of a commercial, you know, be part of rewarding a commercial entity on the core. Yeah, exactly. So like Operable is a great example. When we shipped COG, we made the decision that um, we were going to follow something that looked like an open core kind of model. We were going to open source the core of the platform. We were going to have a set of management APIs and command line tools for administering it and managing it. We were going to ship Docker containers and, and make the installation and management as easy as possible. And we were going to build a web interface for managing it. And we were going to build some enterprise authentication tools and those were not going to be open source. Um, they were, however, only going to use public APIs to interact with the core. Right. Uh, so we drew a very clear line and it was very defensible and we could sleep at night saying, there's nothing we do in our extension to this project that someone else who wants to solve the same problem can't do for themselves. They just have to, before they do that, ask themselves if they're willing to invest the money in that area. Um, and I think that's really where the open source model makes a lot of sense. It's, it's, it's kind of the same model. I talked about, I've talked about this in the past as why we need ops is the thing, right? You've got this spectrum of work. And if you think about it like a Gartner magic quadrant, as you move to the right, things get more interesting. As you get closer to the left, they're less interesting. And on the, on the Y axis, as they're closer to the bottom, they're, they're less important. And at, at the top, they're more important. So, so important and interesting way up there in the magic quadrant, everybody wants to work on that stuff. Uh, right. Stuff on the bottom, you know, important, but not very interesting. Nobody wants to do it. So you got to pay people to do the important but uninteresting work. Um, right. Actually, I would, I, would go, I would go even further and say that is exactly the thing that you want to find vendored product for 
Exactly. Because you want your, you don't want your team dragged out of the, the top right quadrant down to the back quadrant. All right. Um, I have one, one side comment, which is we, we made exactly the same decision that you were describing with digital rebar and rack end. Um, for, right. from an open source. For, and, and I think that I think and, and we, we spend a lot of time thinking about it and discussing it. And it, it's nice to sort of see that resonating. Um, and then the, 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 the sort of a closing observation to me, based on this, we, we, we in a way could circle all the way back to SRE because what we've just described from SRE to edge and then to open source is that there is a place where operating a project operating a, a platform operating a company has a team of people who specialize in that and there's an error budget and when you want to if you don't want you know you can pay somebody to take that over but you need to be you need to be aware of when you walk back and forth across that line um, yep and I think we we described three scenarios that all have this same sort of mechanism of make it a platform let the platform deal with it. Be prepared to crack that the, the boundaries open when you have to. Yeah, absolutely. When and when you adopt open source, it's still your product. You own the you own your product that has this open source component in it, right? So, when you do that, you have to think about whether you can still support it or not. And if you can't, you know, maybe that project ha that that component you pulled in exceeds its error budget. You got to do something else. Um, super interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I like it. I think there's also there's some interesting. Just as an aside on the open source sustaining thing and a plug for some friends, there's a company called Tidelift that's, that's doing some really interesting work about supporting sustaining work on open source projects that you should totally check out. Cool. Look at, look at Rob wrapping up the whole thing and putting it together like he's an author or something like that. It's nice. Very but well done. Very well done, Rob. Well, Mark, uh, I, we appreciate you joining us. Um, Really interesting conversation, and uh, I like your edge comments. It was a different perspective. As someone who's desperately waiting for cars to drive themselves, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't, I boo you because I don't want to drive anymore. I'm horrible, and uh, I need someone, I need, a, I need a car to drive me. But uh, Marco, Rob, thanks again for uh, the podcast, and uh, we look forward to talking again. Hey, thanks, guys. It was fun. Excellent. This is great, Mark. Thank you.